Hello and welcome to this video lecture on HR strategic planning, strategy at the company level and HR strategy about the workforce are deeply intertwined. HR professionals who want a seat at the table need to understand how HR fits in with a firm's overall strategy. Let's get started. Strategic planning involves all of the procedures for making decisions about the organization's long-term goals and strategies. This indicates that the decision makers in a firm spend lots of time and effort plotting out the course for the firm in the immediate and long-range future. This is high-level stuff. However, it cannot be accomplished without concern for human resource planning, which is the process of anticipating and making provision for the movement or flow of people into, within, and out of an organization. We'll spend ample time on methods for determining both the demand and the supply of labor or human resources, that is, the people who do the work. Whenever there is a disconnect, disconnect I'm sorry, between high-level strategic planning for the firm and basic human resource planning, business owners, employees, and other stakeholders suffer. It is vital to make sure you have enough people on hand to accomplish the goals of the firm. This symbiotic relationship between strategic and HR planning has recently been reformulated as Strategic Human Resource Management, or SHRM, which is the pattern of human resource deployments and activities that enable an organization to achieve its strategic goals. Now the HR folks have a seat at the table, so to speak. Many companies espouse the philosophy that their greatest assets are their people. By envisioning HR planning as SHRM, the field of HR has become very, very important. This SHRM involves two key things. One, strategy formulation, which is the provision of input as to what is possible given the types and numbers of people available. And two, strategy implementation, which involves making primary resource allocation decisions about structure, processes, and human resources. Let's move on. There are six basic steps in the HR planning, and we'll look at individual slides for each of these with specific examples of some of them interspersed between them. However, here are the steps in brief. Mission, vision, and values, environmental scanning, internal analysis, formulating strategy, strategy implementation, and last but not least, evaluation and assessment. Let's move on. Step one the determination of the mission, vision, and values of the organization. What is the mission of the firm? Typically, it involves major decisions about the basic purpose of the organization as well as its scope of operations. For a university, the mission is typically about educating students. More specifically, it could be to be a public, student-centered research institution dedicated to excellence, discovery, and innovation. This is slightly different from the strategic vision, which is a statement about where the company is going and what it can become in the future. The vision statement clarifies the long-term direction of the company and its strategic intent. For a university, it might be to become a premier public university in the state. More specifically, it could be to create knowledge, embrace a diversity of people and ideas, foster cultural and economic development, and educate students to participate fully and freely in the communities of the state, the nation, and the world. The firm's core values are the strong and enduring beliefs and principles that the company uses as a foundation for its decisions. For a university, the values might be integrity, civility, compassion, respect, service, and responsible stewardship. The mission, vision, and values of an organization 
are the high-level decisions made by the boards of directors, CEOs, and top management. They forge these things from amorphous pie-in-the-sky concepts into concrete, tangible reality. Let's move on. Step two involves environmental scanning. This is the systematic monitoring of the major external forces influencing the organization. This is not some casual assessment of the competition. This is the purposeful, intentional, and thorough examination of all external forces affecting an organization. If the firm has a mission, vision, and core values set in stone, now they must figure out how to achieve them or reify them. Reification is the process of making that which is intangible into tangible reality. The things they look at include economic factors, which include general, regional, and global conditions. For example, Texas in the inflation post-pandemic world. Two, industry and comparative trends, which include new processes, services, and innovations. For example, iPad or Salesforce.com. Three, technological changes, which can include but not be limited to robotics and office automation. For example, meetings via Zoom, telework, or online education. Four, government and legislative issues, which include both laws and administrative rulings. For example, changes to the FMLA. Sexual orientation as a protected class characteristic now covered by the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII. Social concerns, which include things like child care and educational priorities. For example, aging baby boomers, high college tuition. Six, demographic and labor market trends, including age, composition, literacy, and immigration. For example, Low-wage, unskilled immigrants, millennials, Gen Z. Let's move on. If step two was an external analysis, we see that step three is an internal analysis that provides the firm with an inventory of organizational skills and resources, as well as an indicator of how well each resource is doing. Cultural audits entail the examination of attitudes and beliefs of workforce and behaviors in which they are engaged. To do this, you need answers to the following questions. How do employees spend their time? Is it meetings? TPS report completion? Chit-chat by the water cooler? How do they interact with each other? Is it formally via internal memos, scheduled Zoom meetings, etc.? Are employees empowered? If the firm is highly centralized, then the answer is no, and they must check with their supervisor before they make an important decision. If the firm is decentralized, then they can make reasonable decisions on their own. What is the predominant leadership style of managers? The leadership styles can run from laissez-faire to totalitarian and from people-oriented to task-oriented. How do employees advance within the organization? Are all top managers hired from the outside, or does the firm promote from within? Core capabilities include the integrated knowledge within an organization that distinguishes it from its competitors and deliver true value to customers. Sustained competitive advantage through people is achieved if these human resources are valuable, rare, unavailable to competitors, difficult to imitate, that is, inimitable, and if they are organized for teamwork and cooperation. Workforce composition is the workforce comprised of strategic knowledge workers, that is, employees who have unique skills that are directly linked to the company's strategy. For example, research and development scientists. Is the workforce comprised of core employees, employees with skills to perform a predefined job that are quite valuable to a company, but not particularly unique or difficult to replace? For example, salespersons or welders. 
is the workforce comprised of supporting labor, employees whose skills are of less strategic value and generally available in the labor market. Examples include clerical workers or retail clerks. Is the workforce comprised of alliance partners? Those are individuals and groups with unique skills, but those skills are not directly related to a company's core strategy. For example, HR consultants. Most workforces are comprised of a mix of these things. Let's move on. A true internal analysis involves forecasting about future needs. We need to forecast about both the supply and the demand of labor. These things must be in balance. If you have too many workers, you need to trim the labor force. Perhaps you simply terminate them or encourage early retirement of them or hope for adequate attrition. For example, when the Wuhan virus hit the world, Many universities gave early retirement severance packages to senior faculty so they could trim the workforce and reduce payroll. If you need more workers, you will have to set up a plan to determine how many you need and where you will find them. There are two basic approaches to forecasting, quantitative and qualitative. The next several slides give some concrete examples of how to do this. Let's move on. This forecasting technique for labor demand is a quantitative approach called trend analysis. Here we are trying to forecast how many salespersons we will need in the future. We have data from the past seven years and we want to make projections for the next three years. Thus, we are trying to calculate the three values in the red box on the bottom right side of the table. Here, they are already computed for you, but these are the steps involved in their calculation. The technique of forecasting labor follows these steps explicitly. One, in the leftmost column, we see years numbered vertically one through 10. Years one through seven are in the past, and we have archival records for them. Years in the future are noted with asterisks and are years 8, 9, and 10. In the second column, we have the critical business factor. It could be new products released, number of patents, or just about anything that's important to the firm. In this table, it is sales. So we'll base all of our quantitative analysis based upon forecast of sales. Three, in the fourth column, we have the number of employees, that is the human resources, for those seven years. Again, we get those numbers from HR archival data. Our goal again is to predict how many salespersons we will need in the next three years, years eight through 10, based upon projected sales. That is, we need to know what numbers of employees we will need in the red box. Here again, those numbers are already calculated for us, so I will show you how they are computed. Four, in the third column, we can calculate the productivity ratio for the past seven years. This is simply the sales dollars per employee. We cannot calculate this without pulling archival data for columns two and four. We will use the most recent, that is year seven, labor productivity value of 12.52 for each of the next three years projections, years eight through 10. Five, we can plot out the projected sales in years eight through 10, which you will see on the next slide. Here, those results are 4,095,000 for year eight, 4,283,000 for year nine, and 4,446,000 for year 10. Trust me on this. Remember that the labor productivity ratio is borrowed from the most recent year which is year seven. Step six, then we will calculate human resource demand or number of employees needed by dividing the business factor, that is sales dollars, by the productivity ratio for the last seven years. The results are in the red box. Technically, those values are more precisely 327.08 employees, 342.09 employees, and 355.11 employees. Well, you can't have 0.08 persons 
or 0.09 persons or 0.11 persons. So we round those numbers to what you see here, 327, 342, and 355. Let's move on. Here is a bivariate or simple regression plot predicting the number of employees from sales dollars. The four dots to the far right are in perfect line because they all have the same labor productivity ratio. We use the line to project the sales. Sales is a linear relationship over time. The three dots to the right are the projected number of employees needed in the next three years. Let's move on. The following forecasting techniques are decidedly qualitative. One is simply to engage in management forecast, which are simply the opinions or judgments of supervisors, department managers, experts, or others who are knowledgeable about the organization's future employment needs. It can be a gut feeling, a set of judgments based upon past subjective experience, it can be intuition, or just about anything else deemed appropriate by management. Another is the Delphi technique, which is an attempt to decrease the subjectivity of forecasts by soliciting and summarizing the judgments of a pre-selected group of individuals. These judgments are filtered and compiled by someone called a central convener, who synthesizes the judgments and opinions into a smaller number and sends them out for evaluation by other experts. This round of expert judgments are then sent back to the central convener, who distills them into a final forecast, which represents a sort of composite group judgment. This is expensive because of the labor time taken to come up with a final decision. Let's move on. So forecasting demand is one thing, but we also need to forecast supply of workers, which often involves both quantitative analysis and qualitative judgments in the very same technique. Some of them include the following. Skills inventories, which are files, actual paper lists, or more often actual electronic databases of personnel, education, experience, interest, skills, etc., that allow managers to quickly match job openings with employee backgrounds. Replacement charts, which are listing of current job holders and persons who are potential replacements if an opening occurs. Succession planning, which makes use of replacement charts, but is a formal process of identifying, developing, and tracking key individuals for executive positions. Staffing tables, which are a graphic representation of all organizational jobs, along with the numbers of employees currently occupying those jobs and future, either monthly or yearly, but future employment requirements. Markov analysis is a more formal application of the staffing table, which involves a quantitative method for tracking the pattern of employee movements through various jobs. The next slide provides a nice example of that. Let's move on. This is Markov analysis, which allows us to project the supply of labor at each level in the organization based upon historical trends. Let's look at the row near the bottom called sales associates, technically the second from the bottom. The bottom is forecasted supply. The row above it will look at much more closely sales associates. There are 1,440 of them. Now in the past, 1,066 or 74% remained in that level of job year after year. 20% exited or left the company. Either they were fired or they quit. Additionally, 6% or 86 were promoted to department manager. None got promoted above department manager, however. In fact, all promotions and demotions within this company were only one level up or down. So let's look at the department manager level jobs. In the past, 72% remained in that level year after year. 10% were promoted one level. 
2% were demoted and a full 16% were terminated. At the very top, 90% of store managers remained in that level. None accepted demotions and 10% exited the company. So based upon the current supply, we can forecast where they will be in the future. It's a neat technique and actually quite simple to implement and only requires a little third grade math. Let's do some of that math here. Look at the column called Sales Associates. We see that we have 1,066 who stayed in that role and six who were demoted to that role. That gives us 1,072 current salespersons. However, we typically have 1,440 salespersons, so we need to hire 368 salespersons. We can do this math at any level. Let's do it again at the assistant store manager. We see at the bottom of that column, we have forecasted supply of 41. We see, however, that we only need 36. That means that five must be either promoted, demoted, or exit. That could be a serious problem. Let's move on. This is a replacement chart. Each person in the hierarchy has two ratings. The letter indicates whether they are A, promotable now, B, need development, or C, simply not fitted for their current position. The number indicates their performance level, which ranges from one superior to four poor. In an ideal world, all would get a rating of A1. On the flip side of that, all high performers can't all immediately be promoted because there's only one manager at the top. Some people have to continue to perform their current jobs and sometimes for a long time. Who is the least likely to be promoted in this chart? Look closely. The answer is A.T. Tupper. A.T. Tupper has a promotability rating of C and a performance rating of 4. Rather than moving up, he'll probably be moving out. Which person would you promote to assistant manager if both Gordon and Brown left the company at the same time? That is, who will be the new assistant manager? The choice will likely be between C.K. Broderick, the division HR manager, and B. Verkosen, one of the two planning division managers. They have very different roles. The choice between them will likely be based upon what the company makes or sells. That is, the decision on who to promote depends upon the industry in which the firm operates. If it is a temp agency that places temporary workers in jobs with local businesses, it should probably be Broderick, the HR manager, who gets promoted. If the company is a growing international conglomerate, it would probably be Verkosen from the planning division, who, given that planning is such a vital part of growth. Let's move on. Step four is strategy formulation. This involves moving from simple analysis to devising a coherent, often detailed course of action. Strategy is a plan to deal with the future. Most of the time, the future is unknown, so we must try our best to figure it out. This often relies on SWOT analysis, which is a comparison of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for strategy formulation purposes. SWOT analysis uses the strengths of the organization to capitalize on opportunities, to counteract threats, and to alleviate internal weaknesses. SWOT analysis is probably old hat, so to speak, for business students, so I won't belabor the point here. Let's move on. There are various types and levels of strategy. Corporate strategy involves high-level things like growth, which can be geographic, volume, or customer types. 
Diversification is the development of new product lines. For example, GE has extreme diversification from jet engines to light bulbs, and they used to be involved in high finance. Mergers involve combining the efforts of two companies. For example, airlines merge all the time. Broadcasters like ABC, ESPN, and Disney, all three merge together. Acquisitions occur when a company buys a competitor or even an unrelated company. Strategic alliances are common in the airline industry when they share airport slots and reservation systems but have no sharing of the ownership of assets. And lastly, joint ventures involve some sharing of ownership of assets but not to the extent of a merger or an acquisition. Business strategy is all about value creation. Value is what the firm adds to a product or service by virtue of making it. The amount of benefits provided by the product or service once the cost of making it are subtracted is value equals benefits minus costs. There are a multitude of different business strategies, but here I'll only discuss two. First is the low-cost strategy, where a company competes on productivity and efficiency. They keep costs low to offer an attractive price to customers relative to their competitors. Walmart is the prototypical example. In fact, their advertising tagline is, Walmart, always the low price. The other main strategy is a differentiation strategy in which a company competes on added value. This involves providing something unique and distinctive to customers that they value. Examples include Apple and Ferrari. Functional strategy ensures alignment of the various functions like operations, marketing, accounting, etc. with each other. For example, an operation strategy of being a low-cost provider is simply incompatible with a marketing strategy of differentiation where high prices are usually the goal. There are two main forms of this functional strategy. The first is external fit or alignment, which focuses on the connection between the business objectives and the major initiatives in HR. The second is internal fit or alignment, which aligns HR practices with one another to establish a configuration that is mutually reinforcing. Let's move on. Step five involves the implementation of the strategy. Remember, in HR, we are primarily focused on the need for employees. So our strategy is to take action to reconcile supply and demand considerations. If supply of employees is up and demand is down, maybe we don't need to hire so many workers. If supply is down and demand is up, maybe we need to hire some new people. This requires some adept forecasting of business activities and trends, for example, both international expansion and new product lines will need new employees. However, a downsizing or selling of some assets could indicate that there are too many employees. Locating applicants can be tough in a tight labor market for rare skills. There is currently a high demand for data analysts and artificial intelligence experts. Those jobs are getting top dollars. On the other hand, some firms have to engage in organizational downsizing so they can reduce headcount. The decision then revolves around a determination of whether they should downsize by using termination via layoffs or use attrition and slowly reduced headcount by virtue of simply not filling empty slots when people leave. Attrition is the easiest way, but its efficacy depends upon the right positions emptying. If all of the salespeople quit and no one is hired to fill their jobs, a company may be faced with zero sales. That's not good. Making layoff decisions can be the best way to critically manage the reduction in workforce. So, they enact termination based upon seniority, or should they use performance? That is, do the most junior people lose their jobs? Or do the worst performers lose theirs? If we are under a collective bargaining or labor agreement, that will be spelled out in the contract. But it's almost always certainly based upon seniority with the newbies being the first to be let go. Let's move on. Step six 
entails the evaluation and assessment of the strategy. Did it work? Can we improve on it in the future? Where did we mess up? Evaluation and assessment issues are mainly regarding the interplay between corporate or business strategy with HR planning. This includes efforts like benchmarking, which is the process of comparing the organization's processes and practices with those of other companies. Finding the appropriate company to compare one's company to is paramount. Some of this sort of data is available from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and some of it is available from subscriber services, in which a service collects data and reports scores on several metrics to those who will provide their data. So if you give your data, you can see the data of your competitors to a certain point, and it's usually anonymized. The balanced scorecard is a measurement framework that helps managers translate strategic goals into operational objectives like financial objectives, customer objectives, process objectives, or learning objectives. This is used to provide a more holistic picture of organizational performance and avoids only looking at the bottom line or the financial objective. The next slide gives a pictorial example of the BSC or balance score card. Let's move on. Here we have a balance scorecard or BSC for a chain of coffee shops. We see that this company has a focus on the financial bottom line by virtue of its objective called financial. They have other foci, but let's talk about the financial part of their BSC. Their financial objectives are profitability, growth in revenue, and an improvement in cost structure. Let's focus on their objective called revenue. See the second bullet point in the first row of the measures column. They then list a revenue target of 30% compound annual growth rate. The initiative they will take to achieve that target focuses on growth in the U.S. To be clear, all three financial objectives are likely intertwined. As one's revenue improves, one's market value improves, and as U.S. growth increases, corporate layoffs decrease. These are not likely to be standalone, disjointed, unrelated objectives, measures, targets, and initiatives. Let's look closer at the bottom row. People. They have an objective of store manager stability. They will measure that objective with average tenure of managers. The target of the objective is that managers work there at least three years on average. The initiatives they will use to achieve that are managerial training, awards, and stock. They have obviously determined that managers are important to their mission and that managers with three years of tenure on average in that role perform that job well. So they have developed training opportunities, benefit policies, and employee stock ownership plans that are designed to achieve that. This company walks the walk instead of just talking the talk that people are their greatest asset. They've made people issues one of their top four strategic priorities. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.